What a privilege it is to be here with all of you studying this glorious epistle. It's an epistle that shows us how God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light and how God calls us to go right back into that dark world, shining his light. Please turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, and we'll be reading through chapter 3, verse 12. That's 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Hear the word of the Lord. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. This is the word of the Lord. Few New Testament ethical texts jar us more than this one. Peter's words arrest us because they're so counterintuitive to the way we think as a society about who we are and why we're here. For example, I 
recently walked through my local bookstore just to browse some of the titles and get a feel for what's out there. And here are some of the titles that I saw. Manifest Your Destiny, The Nine Spiritual Principles for Getting Everything You Want. You Can Heal Your Life. Level Up Your Life, How to Unlock Adventure and Happiness by Becoming the Hero of Your Own Story. These titles express something of what our society believes about human identity and purpose. Who are we according to these titles? We are spiritually autonomous beings who control our own futures. We sit in the driver's seat and we steer our life toward success, prosperity, self-fulfillment, independence, the, the supreme values and aspirations of our age. Peter's instructions here in 1 Peter 2, 11 through 3, 12 paint a radically different picture for us. He shows us two characteristics of the true believer which set her apart from the world, namely her status and her conduct. In verse 11a, he notes our distinctive status as believers, who we are in this world. In verses 11b and 12, he addresses how therefore we are to conduct ourselves. And then in verse 13 and following, he shows us how to live out this new conduct in four different relational contexts. So let's examine first of all what Peter says about our status in verse 11a. He begins with that simple but all important word, beloved. Some of your translations have dear friends, but the word is simply beloved. Well, beloved by whom? Certainly, these readers are beloved by the Apostle Peter, but far more importantly, they are beloved by God himself. And so are you. We are God's children, his beloved children, members of the family of the triune God. And we're beloved sojourners and exiles. We're just traveling through. This world is not our home. In fact, we are far from home. We, we live here in tents, not castles. In order to live the Christian life, we must set our hearts on our true home, not on the things of this world. We know that this is utterly vital and, and completely different from the way most people relate to the world. As a human race, we're always seeking to settle down, to, to get comfortable, to, to find security and success in this life. But Peter tells us that Christians are not like this. Rather, we're like the faithful Jews in their exile in Babylon. They lived responsibly in Babylon, but they desperately wanted to return to their home, Jerusalem, the city of God. And sisters, so too, we must long for the new Jerusalem promised us in Revelation 21. And our ultimate citizenship there determines how we conduct ourselves here. Several weeks ago, I, I spent time with one of my best friends whose husband is a diplomat in a foreign country. Their status as ambassadors of their country in a foreign land shapes almost everything about the way they live their lives. It not only determines how he spends his working hours Monday through Friday, but how they relate to people in their apartment building, how they strategize about evangelism, even how they interact with waiters at restaurants. Their vocational effectiveness depends upon embracing their strangeness and putting it to use for the good of that particular foreign country in which they serve. Now, I hasten to add that my friend is also strange in other less noble ways, but that's another story for another day. As Christians, we must embrace our strangeness too. We can't really begin to live the Christian life in this world until we understand our Christian status in this world. Sometimes it's, it's when we face hardship that we're most tempted to forget who God has made us to be and we do face hardship. In verse 11, internal forces wage war against our soul. 
and external forces in verse 12, people who misunderstand us and speak against us. And the devil himself prowls around like a roaring lion looking to devour us. In this place far from home, we struggle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. The Christians in Asia Minor to whom Peter writes felt these tensions. They were misunderstood and despised by their culture on account of their identification with Jesus. Did you notice how in Peter's application of this new conduct, he focuses on the most socially vulnerable Christians and the grueling circumstances they might face on account of their faith? Did you notice that? Peter's not interested in an anesthetized portrait of the Christian life. He applies this new status in Christ to the verbally bullied, the socially, politically disenfranchised, the physically, emotionally weary, the lonely, the vulnerable, the reviled. He applies this new status in Christ to you and to me. Some of us here are in situations that feel utterly desperate. Because of our Christian convictions, people whom we love misunderstand us. Because we don't endorse certain cultural values, society calls us hateful and hypocritical people. And because we may have wrestled with the same old sin and the same old brokenness year after year, we feel beaten down. Yes, these, these situations can be truly dark but the darkest, most complicated circumstance in your life can become the very platform upon which God most brilliantly displays his mighty strength. We're far from home, yes, but we are not far from him. It's true that you're an alien and a stranger. It's true that you may have to face cancer or betrayal or the loss of a loved one. It's true that you may lose your job or fail an exam, but you will never face the withdrawal of God's love for you. Your permanent status is beloved of God. Your, your unchangeable identity is beloved citizen of the city of God. Are you quite sure you've received this distinctive status? Do you belong to him? and to his kingdom? And if so, do you see yourself as a sojourner in this world who is dearly beloved by the Lord? Perhaps some of us need to ask God to grant us for the first time this new identity in Christ, or else to, to remind us again who we are in Christ. Please don't miss this opportunity. That's why we're here. Now notice in our text that this God-given status is the foundation upon which all subsequent discussion of Christian conduct must rest. It's as beloved sojourners that we heed Peter's instruction here. The, the scriptures always make explicit the priority, the logical priority of Christian identity before Christian ethics. But at the same time, our distinct identity must lead to a distinct way of life. So the second major observation we want to make from this text is that we are a people with a peculiar conduct that is based upon our peculiar status. We're following Jesus far from home. We're not aimless wanderers. <laughs> We're people on mission to glorify God in a strange land. Let's take a moment to observe Peter's flow of thought here. Please look with me at your passage. In 2, 11 and 12, Peter summarizes the key themes of his entire exhortation. And his central idea about how we follow Jesus far from home is this. As beloved sojourners, resist evil and do good for the glory of God. As beloved sojourners, resist evil and do good for the glory of God. But Peter doesn't just tell us to resist evil and to do good. He shows us how. In 2.13 through 3.12, he applies these principles to four representative relationships. 
Beloved sojourners, resist evil and do good for the glory of God in civic life in 2, 13 through 17. In professional life in 2, 18 through 25. In marital life in 3, 1 through 7. And finally, in all life in 3, 8 through 12. So first, Peter summarizes how we follow Jesus far from home. And then he unpacks this in four very important contexts. So how do we follow Jesus far from home? We do two things. The first is negative. We abstain from the passions of the flesh. The second is positive. We conduct ourselves honorably. These are two sides of the same coin. (laughs) Renouncing evil, embracing good, and we do all this because of who we are, beloved sojourners. Let's first examine the negative, verse 11. We resist evil. We have, we have nothing to do with the passions of the flesh. Well, what are these passions of the flesh? Basically, by, by passions of the flesh, Peter means lusts of the, of the mind and body and heart. Desires that oppose the fruits of the spirit. Lusts like pride, greed, bitterness, envy. And these passions of the flesh will destroy us if we let them. In this place far from home, we cannot forget that we are in the midst of war. And the war's not just out there. It's in here. Even the passions of our own flesh wage war against us. And and we must engage this spiritual battle with all the weapons God supplies us. But now notice the positive dimension in verse 12. We must do good. We keep our conduct among the Gentiles honorable. By Gentiles here, Peter simply means people who do not profess faith in the Lord Jesus. We engage in society with all sorts of people who hold all sorts of beliefs. And as we do so, we adopt a way of life that is noticeably good to them. But why? Why do we abstain? Why do we keep for the glory of God? Look again at verse 12. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Our behavior in in public and private should show the truthfulness of the Christian message we proclaim, despite any efforts of those who may slander us. Now, this truthfulness may not be made known in our lifetime but certainly on the day of visitation, the day when God will come to judge the living and the dead. And on that day, every creature will glorify God, whether through condemnation or through salvation. And how we long that people would glorify God by turning to Christ in faith. People who have grown up in the church People who have never set foot in a church building. People from every tribe, tongue, and nation. People who are presently hostile to Christ and even murdering Christians. Because we love God and because we love lost people, we rejoice to live out our distinct Christian identity in this world in full view of society, appealing to people through our lips and our lives to be reconciled with their maker. Peter shows us that there is a great deal at stake in the way we conduct ourselves in this life. Now let's get practical because that's exactly what the apostle Peter does here. He addresses four theaters of our lives in which we live out this peculiar conduct beginning with our civic life in 2, 13 through 17. And in civic life, beloved sojourners resist evil and do good for the glory of God. These first century Christians in Asia Minor knew the complexities and the cost of identifying with Jesus in the public square. Peter wasn't writing to the culture shapers of the day. His readers, a a tiny minority in the Roman Empire, felt fearful and oppressed and disenfranchised in the midst of a corrupt political social system. And that resonates with us. 
Many of us increasingly feel unprotected or undervalued by our political systems. Our culture often sees the public articulation of Christian convictions as an infringement on others' civic freedoms. And so we must now endure frequent ignorant and unfounded accusations against Christianity. And when we're treated unfairly, the passions of our flesh rage. And we're tempted to indulge them in one of three ways. Sometimes we fight, often on social media. We view public figures or systems as our ultimate enemies. Perhaps because we've bought the lie that our story is tied up, bound up with the stories of this world, of the rise and fall of nations, of institutions, even of certain constitutional liberties we hold dear. And we've forgotten that the Christian story is the story of the kingdom of Christ. Sometimes we flee. We form a holy huddle, quarantine ourselves from from our neighbors, whom we suspect disapprove of our religious convictions. Our Bible studies become exclusive clubs with no seats regularly filled by unbelievers. We spend all our time within the confines of our Christian community and thereby have no way of keeping our conduct honorable among the Gentiles. Other times we conform. We don't like being sojourners and exiles, and so we do everything we can to minimize our strangeness in this world. We we just want to be liked and accepted. We, We care more about demonstrating reasonableness according to the standards of our age than in demonstrating holiness according to the standards of our God. But but when we forfeit our distinct status in this world, we forfeit the very purpose of our existence. As Malcolm Muggridge says, never forget that only dead fish swim with the stream. No, instead of fighting or fleeing or conforming, we resist evil and and we do good in civic life. Peter writes in verse 13, be subject to every human institution. He calls us to submit voluntarily to, to imperfect and sometimes unjust civic authorities, giving them no legitimate reason to punish us. And then in verse 17, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Notice we don't fear the emperor, we fear God. We honor the emperor just like we honor everyone else, and we must honor everyone. Imagine how radical it would be if each of us in this room obeyed those two little words. We may be tempted to think, surely this command to honor everyone doesn't apply to certain politicians whose policies I despise, or to comment sections on blogs. But it's hard to wiggle out of these two little words, honor everyone. Not least as as we recall how costly obedience to this command would have been to Peter's original readers or those rulers like Nero to whom Peter calls them to submit. So Peter urges rightful submission to duly established human authorities and respect for all people, both of which express an underlying fear of God. I believe that this means there must be respect and prayers from every believer in the United States of America for either President Hillary Clinton or for President Donald Trump. There, I I said it. (laughs) We do this for the Lord's sake, verse 13. And because, verse 15, it is the will of God that we silence false accusations by doing good rather than by retaliating. God has chosen to reveal his character to oppressors through our good conduct in the midst of oppression. We don't use the freedom Christ has secured for us by his blood to to lead as an excuse, to to lead whatever sorts of lives we want or to say whatever we want about other people. No. Verse 16, God has set us free to serve. This This means that instead of merely searching every possible loophole in our taxes, which we're free to do, We voluntarily give to the poor. 
Instead of simply isolating ourselves behind gated communities and private and home schools, which we're free to do, we take our family and, and we, we help some under-resourced third graders learn how to read. Instead of merely refraining to vote from certain public officials, which we're free to do, we volunteer to, to help at the voting booth. Instead of simply reacting to the tragic murders in Orlando with fear and concern for our own safety and security and that of our children, which we're free to do, we visit our Muslim neighbors and our LGBT neighbors and, and we express our deep commitment to their safety and their security. The Word of God says, don't use your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but live as servants of God. Now, at this point, we, we have to make an important qualification. Sometimes a federal or local government defies God's standards and demands obedience from its citizens in a way that would violate their conscience. Many of us have celebrated the recent decision to put on our United States currency the image of Harriet Tubman, who led hundreds of African-American slaves to freedom in the 19th century. We're memorializing her because she had the courage to defy a government in the areas in which it defied God. And we know from her own account that she did this because of her ultimate allegiance to God. We, too, relate to civic authorities as God-fearers. As we press for social justice, for political legal reform, especially advocating for the poor and marginalized, we must always exhibit a relentless commitment to submit respectfully when our conscience allows and to honor everyone. Peter now turns to a second context in which we live out our distinctive conduct. In professional life, beloved sojourners resist evil and do good for the glory of God in 2.18 through 25. Here he addresses the weakest members of society, the, the household servants. Household servants were slaves. And although first century Roman slavery was radically different than the race-based slavery practiced in the United States, it was still slavery. These men and women would have been subjected to the whims of their masters, which would have been grueling for many of them, especially those who had masters who might have been hostile to the faith and, and might have resented their slaves' newfound religious convictions. First century slavery ought not be equated with 21st century Western workplaces. But it seems to me that we can glean some principles here from this passage about submission to workplace authorities. Whether we're accountants or social workers, most of us work under authority. We, we have supervisors. And sometimes our supervisors create a lot of trouble for us. They might mismanage us, undercut us, even openly mock us on account of our faith. When this happens, we, we usually feel pretty powerless. Now, I'd tell you about my supervisor, but her name's Kathleen Nielsen, so that might get a little awkward. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. So meet me out back. We'll talk about that. Just kidding. She's wonderful. When we feel degraded in our workplace, we're tempted to retaliate. Maybe we try to get even with our boss by gossiping about her with our colleague. Or maybe we refuse to do our best work for that assignment we deem to be unreasonable. Or perhaps we do, we do everything we're supposed to do, but begrudgingly. But when we're living out our distinct Christian identity in this world, we refuse to repay evil for evil. No, instead, we do good. In verse 18, Peter urges submission irrespective of a master's character. Then in verses 19 through 25, he gives us four reasons for obedience to this command even when it's costly. He signals each of these reasons with, with the little word for. You can see this for yourself. In verse 19, 20, 21, and 25. These are very difficult instructions. Humanly speaking, they're impossible. But 
these instructions about patiently enduring injustice lie at the heart of Christian conduct. So how do we do it? We remember who we are, servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we remember whom we aim to please in all things, our master, the Lord Jesus himself. This is massively practical in our professional life. Howard Hendricks, the late Howard Hendricks, tells a, a story about a time when he was delayed on the tarmac for a very long time in an airplane. Some of you can relate to this the last couple of days. And the passengers around him started to get a little impatient, particularly one man who sat near him. And this one man eventually gave the flight attendant all kinds of trouble. Yet she consistently responded to this man, this curmudgeonly man, with kindness and helpfulness. Hendricks was so amazed that he actually stayed in his seat while all the other passengers deplaned just so he could thank her. After everyone left, he said to her, ma'am, will you please tell me your name so that I can write to your airline and commend you for your wonderful performance today? She said, thank you, sir, but I don't work for the airline. Hendricks was obviously a little confused. She said, I work for Jesus Christ. This woman graciously endured hardship in her workplace because she understood exactly what Peter says here. We're following none other than the Lord Jesus. So how do we do it? We remember who we are. We remember whom we aim to please. And above all else, we remember who he is. Look at verse 19. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Mindful of God. Christians persevere in the face of opposition by remembering God and actively relying upon him. The very spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead is near us when we call and supplies us with strength and grace. And he is pleased with us when we endure injustice. For this is grace with God. We don't have to imagine what this way of life like, might look like. We're not operating in the hypothetical here. We've been given a perfect example, Jesus Christ. We see this beginning in verse 21. The word for example here draws upon the idea of a child's grammar book in which she learns to write the letters of the alphabet by tracing over them. Jesus is our pattern. We trace our lives in him. Following in his steps leads us on the path of the consummate beloved sojourner. The one who voluntarily left heaven's splendor to identify with us and make his home with us in this world of suffering. The one who did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but made himself nothing taking on the very nature of a servant. As a beloved sojourner, Jesus resisted evil his whole life, even when fiercely tempted in the wilderness directly by Satan. He secured sinlessness by rigorous, ongoing, daily battle against all that waged war upon him, the, the full arsenal of his enemies. And he did good. He kept his conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Jesus fed the hungry, he welcomed the sinner, he taught the wayward, he comforted the grieving, and he did all this out of love for his Father and for a broken and lost world. But this beloved sojourner's commitment to resist evil and do good culminates on his journey to the cross. These footprints lead us to the place of the skull <clears throat> the place of excruciating suffering on account of faithfulness. On that journey, Jesus submitted himself utterly to his Father. And this is astounding. He submitted himself to crooked and cruel earthly authorities. Peter can close his eyes and see all of this like it was yesterday. He was there. He had followed Jesus at a distance, Matthew tells us. This sinless son of God was falsely accused. He was reviled. He was spat upon. He was violated. He was shamed publicly, hanging naked on a tree. Yet he was silent 
He refused to retaliate. How? He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Jesus was mindful of God. He had faith that though he would be found guilty in the courts of men, he would be vindicated in the court of his father. And he lays out the pattern for you and for me. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is our calling. In one of scripture's most explicit passages about a Christian's principal vocation, the paradigm is the cross. But we can't stop here. Peter shows us the example we must follow, yes, but he anchors this in the gift we must receive. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. By his wounds, you are healed. We don't simply follow Jesus because he's modeled a way of life for us. We follow him because he's endured all this sorrow, all this suffering for us for our salvation. Jesus, the suffering servant, must be our savior before he can become our example. An example can't remedy our deepest predicament. An example can't liberate us to die to sin and live to righteousness. No, the whole head is sick, the whole heart faint. We must have a shepherd and overseer of our souls who lays down his life to heal us, his straying sheep. Peter knows that Jesus' death was for him. He had rebuked Jesus for speaking about his need to suffer. He had denied Jesus three times in his hour of great agony. This is why Peter can write with such conviction here about the call to bless when persecuted because Peter knows that he's the persecutor who has received God's everlasting blessing and if we would be servants who follow these footsteps, we must know that Jesus' death is for us. We must personally experience the, the truth about which the hymnist writes, ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. Unless we reckon with the fact that we were those persecutors, we were those revilers, we will never extend true mercy to those who revile us, to those who bring suffering in our lives. So we must do all this in and through the Lord Jesus. We don't do it in our own strength. We can submit to imperfect civil and professional authorities because we trust in God. But now Peter mentions a third crucial context for our distinctly Christian conduct, that of marital life in chapter three, one through seven. And in marital life, beloved sojourners, resist evil and do good for the glory of God. Now I'm not married myself, but some of you have let me in on a little secret. Marriage is tough. As G.K. Chesterton said, marriage is an adventure like going to war. <laughs> In 3, 1 through 6, Peter once again pastorally addresses some of the most vulnerable members of these congregations. He knows that for a Christian woman, marital submission to an unbelieving man was severely challenging. Many of you know the pain and complication of being married to a man who isn't following the Lord Jesus, who, as, as Peter writes, is disobedient to the word. Some of you have been praying for years, for, for decades, that God would remove your husband's heart of stone and grant him a heart of flesh. Maybe you're tired. Maybe you feel profoundly alone. May God comfort you that your story is embedded right here in God's holy inspired word as a situation in which he delights to work. 
And he embeds us in a body of believers, even, even the whole company of the saints across redemptive history who have hoped in God in the midst of hardship, like Sarah. So even in this intimate form of suffering, we follow Jesus far from home. And those of you in this situation know that this requires ongoing, deliberate effort to resist evil. Peter addresses at least three temptations in this passage. Sometimes in our marriages, we're, we're tempted to use words in unhelpful ways. Maybe we think we can force our husbands to change by arguing with them. Or maybe we retaliate against them, either overtly or passive-aggressively. Other times, we're tempted to distract ourselves from the pain with the material and the external. Whether married or single, many of us feel dissatisfied in our station in life. And it can be so tempting to hush the loud cry of our hearts with stuff. Stuff can give us the illusion of that control we so desperately crave. Have a bad day at work, go buy some new shoes. Got rejected by another guy, just jump on Instagram and post that striking picture of yourself from Sugar Greg. <laughs> I don't have one of those, but. When we're most aware of our inadequacies, we are most tempted to find our security in our hair, our jewelry, our clothing, our bank accounts, our social status, the success of our children, the success of our ministry. We adorn ourselves with these things so that our lives will feel full, but we do it because we feel empty. Other times, thirdly, we're, we're tempted to, to cave in on ourselves and fear and anxiety. The women in this situation in Peter's day certainly might have had reason to be afraid, humanly speaking. Though some women enjoyed a certain level of independence, generally, in that culture, a wife was expected to adopt her husband's religion and obey him in all things. So for a Christian woman, for example, to refuse to violate her conscience by worshiping her husband's false god might have provoked anger in him. Maybe he would have spoken harshly with her or threatened her or forced her into isolation or other truly frightening things. In such circumstances, it would have been easy to drown in fear. The gospel shows us a better way. We resist evil. These temptations to rely on our words, to distract ourselves with the external, to live in fear. And we do good committing ourselves to follow in the steps of the Lord Jesus. Peter writes in verse one, be subject to your own husbands. Now this is not a general command for all women to be subject to all men. Peter calls for a wife to submit to her own husband with the result that they may be one without a word. Her ordinary, ongoing, regular, respectful conduct commends God's character to her husband. And rather than distracting ourselves with the superficial, in verse 3, Peter urges, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. God's sight. Others may not see your faithful plodding in his steps, day after day, moment after moment, but God sees the beauty of a Christ-following heart is precious to him and will never fade away. And rather than being enslaved to our fears, we hope in God. Now, some object here to, to Peter's language in verse 6 because they claim it somehow sanctions wicked behavior on the part of a husband, as if Peter is minimizing the evil of a man abusing his wife. I'd like to say in clear and certain terms that God does not call a woman to subject herself to anything that violates her Christian conscience, including willingly submitting to a husband's physical or sexual violence against her. I recognize that some of us in this room have experienced the evil of domestic abuse and the pain, the horror, the loneliness that so often comes with it. Peter's not commanding that we let anyone abuse us in that way. 
No, re respectful and pure conduct in a situation of domestic violence demands that when we're able, we remove ourselves and we seek help from all necessary authorities, in including our local church pastors and elders if they're willing. This is part of the, the good conduct we must do in this circumstance, mindful of God and full of hope. And, and if we have any question about whether Peter sanctions abuse here, all we need to do is read the next verse, verse 7, in which Peter charges husbands likewise to follow in the footprints of Christ. Christian husbands must abstain from any passions of the flesh that would tempt them to use their power to belittle or to exploit rather than take advantage of a woman's comparative physical or social weakness in that culture. What I, what I take Peter to mean by women as the weaker vessel. Christian husbands must show their wives honor and understanding. Peter leaves absolutely no room for any sort of domineering here. For example, in, in Peter's day, women generally weren't legal heirs. But despite distorted cultural messages about the value of one gender over the other, the Christian knows that believing men and believing women share full equality in their status as beloved sojourners, co-heirs of the grace of life. God takes the Christian husband's duty toward his wife so seriously that he will not hear his prayers if he abuses his authority. For those Christian husbands who heeded Peter's instructions, consider how this would have made visible the grace of God among the Gentiles in that day. How it would have shown forth the beauty of God's good design in which a husband lays down his life for his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The, the winsome witness of a loving marriage has massive evangelistic power. Finally, 3, 8 through 12. In all life, beloved sojourners, resist evil and do good for the glory of God. As we relate with fellow believers, verse 8, we abstain from things that divide us. We, we always bear in mind that we're siblings in Jesus. And as we relate with all people, verse 9, we don't repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but we bless for to this you were called. This is the same call, the call to walk in the footprints of Christ. And when, like Jesus, we bless the very person who persecutes us, we display our Christian identity in its most brilliant colors. A dear friend of mine who is African American recently shared a family story with me. His grandfather, Reverend Willie Jenkins Jr., raised their family in Pearl, Mississippi. Reverend Jenkins endured serious hardship since many politically and socially empowered people in his day mistreated him because of the color of his skin. Things grew especially tense in Pearl when families like the Jenkins family, acting on the basis of their Christian conviction, worked toward the ethnic integration of public schools. In response, a group of white teenagers habitually cruised through the Jenkins neighborhood, firebombing homes. One night, these teenagers came to terrorize the neighborhood again. Reverend Jenkins and his young sons stood outside their house, ready to defend their family if need be. While the teenagers engaged in their usual violence, the unexpected happened. They ran out of gas <laughs> right in front of the Jenkins house. Before Reverend Jenkins stood a group of teenagers who repeatedly had victimized his family. His sons, stunned by the turn of events, looked up at their dad, ready to follow his command. He slowly left his post. He picked up a glass bottle, shattered it on the ground. His sons looked at his dad. All right, here we go. He walked over to his own car and started siphoning gasoline. His sons then watched their father <clears throat> walk towards these white teenagers, 
with blood from the glass that cut his skin and gasoline flowing down his arms. He knelt down and filled the empty tank of his oppressors. This is the way of the cross. It's a costly way, but a blessed way. We know it's blessed because we've seen how God the Father responded to his son's way of life. He raised him from the dead. He enthroned him at his right hand, and he gave him rule over the entire cosmos. God calls us to walk this Calvary road because he desires to bless us too. Peter teaches us this in verses 9 and 12, 9 through 12, that you may obtain a blessing. We obtain this blessing in part now, and we will obtain it fully in the future. We're blessed now. Verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. When we make visible the goodness of God in this world, he is near us, and his favor rests upon us. We know resurrection life in this world of suffering, and we will be blessed in the future. Look at verse 10. Peter writes of seeing good days. Well, when we lean upon the whole context of this letter, we understand the full scope of these good days, and we will indeed see them. We will know resurrection life in the new heaven and new earth, the place of our ultimate citizenship where God will wipe away every tear from our eye and where justice will reign. Sisters, as we follow Christ in a death like his, so we shall follow him in a resurrection like his. We're following Jesus far from home, but one great and glorious day, we shall follow Jesus home. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we are amazed by you. We thank you for the gift of your son who is our good shepherd. We thank you that he chose to leave heaven's splendor to make his home with us. We ask, Father, that you would equip us to persevere, to, to stand firm in true grace. We need you. We need you. Would you pour your spirit upon us? It's for the glory of Jesus and out of love for Jesus that we pray these things. Amen.